Any of you have heard of Nick Vujicic? I think I said his name right. Nick Vujicic? So, how many of us have not heard of Nick Vujicic? So, he's been here to Orlando many, many times. You may have actually seen him or heard about him. He's a gentleman from Australia. He has no arms and no legs. And he goes around the world. He gives motivational speeches. And he, he's actually a pretty powerful believer. And uh, he's, been, he's been on this circuit for many years. I think almost 15, 20 years. Have you seen him now? Do you know who we're talking about now? Yeah. yeah. I think he's been to Northland several times. He's been to Faith Assembly. And he's very powerful. So a few, few weeks ago, I went to the NRB. Who knows what the NRB is? So it's a National Religious Broadcasters. This is, this is where or, or, uh, the convention is when all of these Christian broadcast net, networking types, they come together and they, they convene and they converge and they have discussions about how to go forward, how things are going. You know what a convention is. So they had this huge NR, NRB convention here a few weeks ago. Now, this is when uh, Jonathan um, Feldstein was here. Jonathan Feldstein actually came for the NRB. So what happened this year that was different from former years is that the organizers of the NRB, they organized so that con a contingency from Israel would come and be very much involved in this year's NRB. And they were a very, very, very uh, well-known and established contingent, people that, were, people that are very, very famous in Israel, uh, were there at the NRB this year. So Nick, Nick was there. And I was, I was really, really pleasantly surprised when he got up and spoke. So throughout the week, I think the, the conference or the, 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 the event lasted a full week. And throughout the week, they had many shops, many different types of uh, uh, you know, events that were slated throughout the week. One of those events were about Israel, uh, Christian support for Israel. I think that's how they framed it, more or less. And they had all these incredible Israelis, people that we know and people that we've interacted with before, that were there. And this, this, this man, this young man, I'm not sure how, he's probably in his 40s by now. So this, 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 this incredible person, and just based on who he is and what he does, his condition, he's pretty outstanding. And again, he's an excellent speaker, excellent speaker, and and powerful. He got up, and I was a little bit perplexed at first, or a little bit questioning at first, why is he going to, why is he going to speak about Israel? I've never heard him speak on Israel. You know, he gives, again, motivational type spe uh, speeches. He's, he's, he's an evangelist. He speaks on salvation. Wonderful. But I said, okay, so he's going to speak. He's going to say something about Israel. And I got to tell you, he really shocked me. I mean, he really, really surprised me. I was, I was in awe of what he did and how he presented himself, how he defended uh, Israel, but not just defended Israel from the standpoint of being a conservative, because it was obvious from his, from his presentation that he didn't care much about appeasing anyone. He wasn't there to, to, to platform his conservative position, but he was there to, 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 at that particular meeting to declare his allegiance with Israel, an unconditional and the way he presented it was incredibly powerful, surprised me. And I think surprised just about everyone in the room. I don't think I've ever seen him that animated and that passionate. I don't think I've ever seen him that way. He was extremely, extremely uh, passionate. I, I, was, I was just so blown away by it. The whole room got quiet. He spoke for just a few minutes. And the room was just, you can hear a pin drop. So as this was happening, I said, somebody's got to say amen. So I said amen, and it was like echoing throughout the room. It, it was like very few people was responding to him. And I couldn't understand why. I, I, I kept saying there, needs, there need to be an applause. There need to be interruptions of applause here. Uh, of course, there was sort of a, at the end of it, sort of a... Because he really shocked the people that were there. He shocked the Israelis with his passion with his fervor, with his words, they were kind of taken back by it. But the Christians that were there were particularly shocked and taken back because he really went after conventional Christianity. And I, I, wanna, I wanna play that, that video for you this morning. I've asked Amado to, to have it up on the wall for us. 
So it's going to be up on the wall now. And I, I want us to pay attention to this. This young man, Nick Vu, Vu how do you say it? Vunicic. Vunicic. I promise not to make fun of you guys when you slip up. So this young man is incredibly powerful, but even more so powerful because he is pointing out the wrongness of Christianity and their relationship to Israel. Powerful. So take a look at this. Our next speaker is a very humble man. He wouldn't say this, but he's a hero. And I say that without hesitation. And once I learned that he was such a huge supporter of Israel, I loved him even more. Nick Vujicic is an Australian-American born without arms or legs who has become a world-renowned speaker. He's a New York Times best-selling author, coach, and entrepreneur. Nick is also an outspoken advocate for Israel, having visited there just last year where he met one-on-one -on -one with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Nick Vujicic. Thank you. I'm very overwhelmed. Can you turn me down, please? I'm very overwhelmed with emotions tonight. I'm, I'm very humbled that I'm even given that many minutes here tonight. I'm humbled to be here. I will never forget going to Israel for the very first time. I knew the years of me traveling 78 countries and God said, I'm gonna take you to Israel, but not yet. When I met with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, he said, what took you so long? And I explained to him that I've had an incredible opportunity as a Christian to go into neighboring countries of Israel, including Iran. I get into places that people normally cannot get. And if you get in, you normally can't get out, but I can get out. <laughs> they can't get my fingerprints and no one can handcuff me. <laughs> but ever since we were children, my parents always said, pray for Israel, pray for Israel, pray for Israel. My parents actually had to flee their own country, former Yugoslavia, had nine different national flags at one stage, no national anthem for a couple of years. Vujicic is Serbian, but I could never imagine what the Jew Orthodox family have gone through, not just in Israel, but as a Western Christian who lives out here in America, and everyone's like, wow, Nick, you got kicked out of a bank? Yeah. Nick, you had a grenade at your house and the FBI squad came to your house in California? Yeah. But I met a young woman tonight whose mother and father, they had a synagogue in England and it was burned to the ground. They were fleeing their life. We must understand that please listen to everything that has been said up here and take heed to what has been said. I can never imagine, and I'll tell you right now, Hezbollah is really real. The Quran also says that a way that Islamic people can go to their heaven is also kill a Christian, and they get a wild card, and the Quran says that they can burn us, stake over the fire, and eat our flesh. This is what the Quran says. Do you know that? We are talking about the fundamentalism 
of what this war really is in America and Israel. It is not really so much against flesh and blood, but spiritualities of powers of darkness, pure evil. And yes, I stand with Israel. And yes, we pray for Israel. And my heart has hope in knowing that in our scriptures as Christians, we know that even when every nation comes to Israel and no other nation actually stands with Israel, according to our scriptures, when the war happens and the, your enemies are coming to your border, our scriptures say that God himself will open up the earth and swallow Israel's enemy. This is what Christians believe. I don't know if you know that. So we know you're God's people because we serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, totally different than any other God. And I want to ask every rabbi for forgiveness. You don't have to sugarcoat it. We haven't neglected Israel ever like we've neglected now. Where are we? We're talking nuclear threat. Where are we? And I want to ask Israel for forgiveness. We should have given you already billions of dollars for Aliyah, for every single Jewish person to go home. For if we are delusional, we believe in the same prophecy, yet you have not received a hundred billion dollars from American churches who say we pray for you and we haven't given you a check and I don't know how many checks you're even gonna get tonight. Forgive America, we are asleep, we are on a ventilator. And of all the nations, America and of all the generations, our generation will be judged harshly by the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob because you ain't a room of the generation of America. We knew too much. We know too much. We have a lot given to us. We are the generation that has been given the most and sacrificed the least. Forgive us, Israel, for not standing with you. Forgive us about going to the Holy Land and experiencing it for ourselves, yet we forget the Israeli people here in America and standing and having Shabbat together and learning how we can help children in Israel and learning how we can help the veterans there in Israel and learning how we can pray with you. We stand with you, or do we? It is the 75th anniversary of an incredible moment for your nation. And I pray that some people give to your nonprofits tonight. Shame on us if we don't. I am not praying for revival in America. I am praying for repentance. We do not deserve another blessing. America needs to repent. And if you're wondering what is happening in our nation the last two and a half years, Perhaps God has called us to a point of a nation that we have indeed lost the skill in our right hand. Perhaps, my friends, perhaps. And I pray 
that in 2024, this election, we need a man of God. Listen to the Israeli people. Listen to what they're telling you. Get on your school boards. Oh, that's political. No, it is spiritual warfare in the towns of where all civilian communities. We've been crippled in saying what we really should say. Shame on us. You think you've seen persecution, America? Nothing have you seen. Nothing, 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 nothing. I'm going to say this for the very first time in public. It's been in my soul for 15 years. Me and my uncle Bata, we saw a vision from the Lord. We saw a million Christians and Jews in Jerusalem. A million Jews and Christians calling upon the name of the God of Asa, Isaac, sorry, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and asking that he would come, that he would restore peace. I'm going over time, I'm sorry, I'll say it this way real quick. And I'll tell you, Israel, Hungary, might be a better brother to Israel before you know it than the crippled, ventilated America. We need peace in Jerusalem. And I will leave you with this. It would have that God would allow me to speak to a rabbi in the last 36 hours here. And do you know what he said? He said, I wish the Christians would proselytize to Islam. Maybe if the Christians actually had faith and courage to go and pray and fast for the salvation of Islam, we might have peace in Jerusalem. Very interesting, very interesting, very interesting, very interesting from a rabbi. I love it. <laughs> May God bless Israel, and I will tell you, we will know in a couple of years if God will bless America, which is absolutely dependent if America repents and blesses God, brings us under Him as a nation under God, and in alignment step by step, concurrently hand in hand, hip to hip, Israel and America would be once again unified according to God's will. God bless you all. So he shocked me pretty much with his passion. Uh, it, was, it was amazing to go to this uh, NRB function and hear, hear these speakers, Christian speakers get up and they do the, pretty much the typical Christian spiel and the rabbis got up and they did, they, did, they did their spiel. And he got up, he was early, he got up and he spoke and, and just sort of rocked the entire foundation of the event. You can tell that he spoke off the cuff. He, he spoke without, without planning a speech. But he was passionate, and he was to the point. So what is he talking about? Why is he bashing America? He, he lives in this country and has enjoyed the benefits of being an American citizen for many years. So what is he go, why is he going after this country? Because he, like myself, have come to the conclusion 
that this country has been sold out. Yeah, we've been sold out. We're not the country that we had the potential to be. I'm an American citizen. I gave the story of my bag last week when I made entry into, port entry into Miami and I had my, uh, my, my green card, my residency given to me. I'm an American citizen. My plan is to live as an American citizen, but I have no hope in this country. My hope in this country evaporated many years ago. In fact, it began to evaporate. The process of evaporation began when, when I became a believer in Messiah Jesus and my trust in God became more relevant than my trust in country. But when I saw the mess that President Trump made with his peace deal, back in 20, 2020, that's when I said, that's it. I have no more hope in this country. My hope is in God only. We had a conservative president who should have won that presidency election pretty easily, hand over, just easily, but he didn't. He made a deal concerning the land of Israel that no president should ever make, and he instantly fell away. So it was a clear conclusion my conclusion was clear that he lost the election because he interfered with Israel. My hope in the American system failed even more. So today, I have hope in the believers that are Americans. I have hope in American believers that we will turn, that we will not fall headlong into a world system that will completely destroy us. To some extent, I have hope there. But I have no hope in this system anymore. When I first came here, I, I had hope in the democratic system. I considered myself to be a Democrat. Uh, that quickly went away as I became a believer because as a believer, God opened my eyes to see so clearly the fallacy of the Democratic Party. So I went from being someone who was middle of the road, partially liberal Democrat, to being an independent borderline, bordering on being a, a libertarian. So that's my political position, but I have no hope in this country, in this government. I have hope in the people that the people will turn and make right with God. I have hope in that. Now, let's talk about Israel. So Nick made some pretty powerful statements concerning Israel. And he wasn't exactly 100% coherent and, 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 and perfectly in alignment, but the things he said was, was so incredibly true and profound and necessary to be said. There were some pretty important Christian people there, leaders in, in, the, Christian, in the Christian world. They were, they were there and they heard it. Now, let's talk about what the Bible gives us concerning an end-time movement, what we call an end-time movement. Nick talked about revival and, you know, He's prayed for revival many years. It's amazing that he said that he's not praying for revival in this country anymore. That's, un that's amazing. So he's definitely moved and hurt. That's obvious. But for many years, his ministry was based on the hope of revival. He went around the world preaching revival. Now he's saying no. Now he's pointing to Israel. That denotes a very real and a very powerful movement that has began to, to occur in the earth among Christians, in the Christian landscape. And this movement is real. It's groundswell. It's from that place. It's very foundational, and it's growing in strength and momentum. It began 2,000 years ago. This movement is not new. It's now gaining strength, but it's not new. There's a... There's a uh, 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 sort of a, 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 an enigmatic verse in, in Micah. It's, a, it's sort of, sort of a, 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 an enigma in Micah, in Micah chapter 5. And it's, it's kind of ironic because the verse that I'm referring to follows a very famous verse, perhaps one of the most famous verses in the Bible that we read on just about every, well, many Christmas postcards. Anybody knows that verse from Micah chapter 5 that I might be that I'm alluding to. Micah chapter 5, postcards, Christmas. Unto us a child is born, right? 
Right, so, so that's a pretty, fam pretty famous verse. But following that verse in Micah chapter 5, there's something that, 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 that provides some insight that's very important. Again, it's an, and it's, it's an enigma to many today, but I'm, I'm hoping to clear this up to some extent. We've, we've, we've talked about this before, and I want to I go to Micah chapter 5 and read this for us. So Micah chapter 5, again, it's Christmas. It's very, very, very famous. Micah chapter 5, verse 2, I want to read verse 2 for you. But as for you, Bethlehem, Ephratah, too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you one will go forth for me to be ruler in Israel. His, going, his goings forth are from long ago, from days of eternity. Now, it sounds a little more poetic in the King James. The New American Standard is not that poetic. But that's what you get on your postcards, right? Of course, it's referring to Yeshua, born in Bethlehem, called by God, appointed to be ruler of Israel. All of, all of it is true. Now, the follow-up verses is what we're going to look at this morning. I'm going to read verses 3 for us. Just one, that one verse, verse 3. And I'm going to put verse 3 into, into a, a, a perspective that's relevant to the reality of what we're seeing in the world today, in the Christian world today, where there is a clear divide, a, a, a buildup of, of people that are recognizing Israel that are becoming passionate about Israel, that are beginning to correct their, perspective, their perspectives on Israel. So that's in Micah chapter 5, verse 3. I'm going to read this for us now. Therefore he, referring to God, will give them up until the time when she, who is in labor, has born a child. So who do we think this is referring to? He there is God. And she would be, of course, Israel. The child would be Messiah Jesus. Right? Is that clear? Right. That, that's, that's found also, in essence, in Revelation chapter 12. And we should go over to Revelation chapter 12 and take a peek at that. So keep that verse in mind, what we've read so far. We've only read half of the verse. I'll read it again. We'll go to Revelation chapter 12 and we'll cross-reference this. Therefore he will give them up until the time when she... Who is in labor has born a child. So now in Revelation chapter 12, I'm going to read from verse 3. Another sign appeared in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon. Ah, let's back up. Let's back up to verse, yeah, verse 1. We'll read verse 1 and onwards. A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and, and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars, and she, has, and she was with child, and she cried out, being in labor and in pain to give birth. And then the dragon and so on, she gave birth to a son. And she gave birth, verse 5, and she gave birth to a son, a male child, who is to rule the nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God to be at his throne. So, of course, that's referring to Jesus. But then, later on in the chapter, it talks about the rest of her offspring in verse 17. So the dragon was enraged with the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Who are the offspring? If the child is clearly Yeshua, the offspring would be the rest of his brethren. And that's exactly what we're going to read right now in, Re in Micah chapter 5, verse 3, the, the other half of that verse that says, Then the remainder of his brethren will return to the sons of Israel. And we're going to pause here for a moment. I'm going to read the whole verse now in context. We know that Israel there, the woman, she gave birth to a son. That son is Yeshua. And that, that son has brethren or, or their offspring of the woman. Therefore he will give them up until the time when she who is in labor has born a child, then the remainder of his brethren will return to the sons of Israel. You don't see that on a postcard much, do you? You've ever read, you've ever read a Christmas postcard? Postcard talking about the brothers of Jesus, the, the rest of the offspring, the brothers, his brothers and sisters, returning to Israel? No, you never, you've never seen that. But it's right there. It's pretty clear. 
The word, the word remnant there, or the word return, or, or remaining, is the word remnant. So he's talking about, quote unquote, the remnant church. Many preachers for at least two, three hundred years have preached about the quote unquote remnant church. The word remnant there means to remain, the rest of. That's actually the Hebrew word. And the Hebrew word there points to the reality of a remnant. The remainder, yes, but a remnant of his brothers. So not all of his brothers will return to Israel. So in this context, who are the rest of the offspring or who are his brothers? Well, we are, his brothers and sisters, we are. And it's clear in that verse that we will return to Israel. If we're going to return to Israel, that means what? That that's where we were before. And what happened? If we were with Israel and we're going to return, a remnant of us, not all of us, will return to Israel, it means that we have departed. Doesn't it? I mean, it's pretty basic logic, right? Has the church separated itself from Israel? Did that happen? Absolutely, it happened. The prophet Micah here concerning this remnant is talking about a time when this, 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 let me say this, the child here referring to Jesus also refers to you. I want you to see that. The child here refers to you as well. It refers to Jesus, but you are in Jesus. You are in Christ. In other words, you are a part of what makes up Christ in the earth today. Is that true? That's absolutely the case. So you are that child, that offspring as well. And you will return to Israel. This is exactly what's happening today. This movement among many Christians around the world, Nick and many, many others, points to the reality that this prophecy is beginning to be fulfilled. We live in an, we live in an extremely exciting time when this is happening right before us, unfolding right before us. Many of us, we've been looking for this for many, many years, for decades. We didn't see it three decades ago, so we got weary. We got tired. And we throttled down. And here we are. It's time to throttle up. It's right before us. It's no time to be weary because the reality of what we hoped for, what we looked for three, three decades ago is unfolding right before us. It's time to gear up because this it's coming fast. The time when the church would fully separate from that other aspect of Christianity, that conventional Christianity that has gone the other way. Nick was pointing to that other aspect of Christianity that has chosen to be conventional, that has chosen to be corporate and be like the rest of the nations relative to Israel. Yes, Christianity, corporate Christianity, is hostile to Israel and cannot be anything but hostile to Israel because they're given over to the spirit of this world. I'm, I'm, I'm saying this categorically. Corporate Christianity has been given over to the spirit of this world and can do nothing but oppose Israel. Not so with the remnant church. The remnant church, the, brother, the brothers and sisters of this son of Israel, Messiah Jesus, who, who we are, that's who we are, we will return to Israel based on the prophecy. Now, this is not the only prophecy that ties us to Israel. There are many more, many more that are frequently ignored and looked over, just completely glazed over, many more. No, not so with us. The prayer and the hope is that there would be many preachers, many prophets, many teachers that will rise like I am, and many more around the world, and declare without any hesitancy, without any shame, without any fear, the reality of where we are today in history. You see, God's timeline from the very moment of the fall to where we are today is what affords us what we know as history. Nothing has occurred throughout the, the, the time of the fall to now that wasn't ordained by God. God has put everything in place. So where we are right now is a pivotal time in history. We talked about this on Friday night. We are no longer in the place that we were in 50 years ago. 
We're at a whole different place. And how do we know that? Because we see how quickly the enemies of God are advancing. Are God's enemies advancing quickly? Are they hastening their, their march to Armageddon? Yes. They are absolutely hastening their march to the valley of Jezreel, the valley of decision. It's happening, and God is the one that's bringing them down. We have to keep pace with this. If we are the armies that will come with Messiah Jesus when he comes, the armies which are in heaven find, with fine white linen, white and clean, come in with him on white horses, if that is true, is that true first of all? Or you didn't sign up for that? You were no part of it? <laughs> is, that, is that where you are? You know, I, I don't want to hear about the coming of Christ, coming of Messiah, a great, great high priest, a warring high priest with a sword, comes to press the wine press of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. I don't want to hear about that. Because that's too, mm, too violent. 250 years ago in Christianity. Too prophetic. I don't want to hear it. If that's where you are, you need to gear up. It's coming regardless. Yeah. It's going to happen. Hallelujah. We're not far from it, actually. And if you're in Christ, and you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, you will rapture when he comes. Don't be shocked when... He, when you're raptured. Don't find yourself suddenly taken back. Whoa, I didn't expect this. Be prepared for it now. Be in the fight now. Gear up now. Prepare yourselves from now for what is to come. Because what is to come is inevitable. Yes. Nothing will stop it. We see the reaction of the evil one. The evil one is reacting to what God is doing. God never reacts. He's always proactive. He initiates what causes the reaction of the enemy? And we see the reaction of the enemy. I told you that this last week, President Biden, and I have to be deliberate to say President Biden, slipped up quite a few times this week. Well, he does that just about every day, right? Why is he slipping up so much lately? Because he's saying words. And if he's saying words, he's slipping up. So he slipped up in a big way. <laughs> I can only imagine the meetings about all of his bloopers, right, that, that his cabinet must have. He slipped up in a major way this week. He talked about, uh, this was somewhere he, he gave a talk, and, and, and I saw this little snippet. He said that by the year 2020, <laughs> I'm bringing it up again, by the year 2020, we're going to put an end to all carbon emissions. Carbon emissions. And that there, there are going to be things in place. He's talking about events that will occur before 2020 that will move towards bringing the world to being free of carbon emissions. He slipped up. So the media didn't catch it. The media was like, oh, he said 2020. What's he talking about? He, he meant to say 2030. That's what he meant to say. Because you should know by now that there are, there is, there are agendas, but there is a very, very strong and pointed agenda towards the year 2030. Have you heard our liberal politicians say anything about the year 2030? No? You're not listening. During the last election period, how many, how many Democrats ran for office, uh, well, competed for that position? I think there was about six or eight of them. Came down to finally three and then two and then one. Biden. They all spoke about the 2030 agenda. Look it up. Don't be caught unawares. By the year 2030, they've envisioned that all of the framework that's necessary to bring the world to a complete halt by 2050 will be set up and in place by the year 2030. 2030 is a big year for the globalists. And they're using the ecology, of course, as a battering ramp. That's what they do, right? Do they really care about the ecology, these globalists? They have no love, no care, no concern at all, actually, for the ecology. They use it as a tool to lever the American people and to lever the people of the world. I gotta tell you, the World Health Organization, the globalists, the World Economic Forum, they are gaining the, gaining the momentum around the world rapidly. You're not aware of it in this country, why? Because your media does not report the news to you. Your media denies you the actual news that you deserve to know. You don't know what's happening around the world, you have no idea because you are being denied the news 
What's the news about Trump? Always about Trump. New charges brought against Trump. Seems like every month there's a new charge brought against him. That's what the media is focused on. And what else is the media focused on? Making, making Biden look as good as possible. Is that even possible? They're doing the impossible somehow. That consumes about 80% of what's being generated from the, from the established media. They're not telling you what's happening in the Caribbean basin. How English-speaking Caribbean countries, the CARICOM is what it's referred to, uh, have, have already and are signing up with every globalist initiative. The World Health Organization, the leader of the World Health Organization, was in Trinidad a couple of weeks ago, brought all of the CARICOM leaders down to Trinidad, and they signed away their very souls to the World Health Organization. Basically saying the next pandemic that comes around, we are going to enforce, use and force, vaccines. Our little Caribbean nations, Gaitri, our little Trinidad, our prime minister, that abomination, signed away the soul of our little island to the World Health Organization. Next vaccine, next, vi next virus, yeah. People are going to be at gunpoint, if necessary, forced to take vaccines. You don't know that's happening around the world. Why? Because your media is not reporting it to you. You need to know what's happening. That's just one little thing that's being kept from you. The globalists are making advances, and they have no good thing in mind. They're malicious. They're malevolent. They are not people that are seeking your good, the good of humanity. They are terrible. So this is happening. So this is not a time to fall asleep. This is not a time to look backwards or to look beyond what's right in front of us. Because it's going to happen. It's going to unfold. Armageddon is rising. Nick's passion is coming from the place of the Holy Spirit prompting him to know that we no longer live in the 1980s. We no longer live in the 1990s. This is no longer the beginning of the, 20th, the 21st century. We live in a completely different place where our own government in the next six years will press the American people to accept what the World Health Organization is proposing. It's, all re it's already been set up before us. Haven't you seen CNN? Haven't you seen MSNBC? It's moving forward. They want to take your vehicles. They want to take your houses. They want to mandate your health, determine what you must do. What you, what you cannot do and what you must do. Already you are conspiracy theorists. The worst kind of human beings. Already you are the blight of this land to these people. Don't fall asleep on the wheel here, folks. It's time to gear up. It's time to smell the coffee. The coffee I'm referring to is the word of God. What is coming, what is inevitable before us. The church, a remnant of the church, based on Micah's prophecy, will return to Israel. What is it to return to Israel? Is it a literal return? Are we going to uh, look for, for work visas to go live in Israel? No. Our return to Israel is what we're doing here right now. Every time a believer says, I am giving up hope in this world. I am putting hope in God's kingdom. I am not going to look at my, 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 my own life as a basis for my hope. I'm going to look to what God is doing in the midst of the earth and what he's doing in Israel. Because God is preparing to establish his kingdom on the earth. I want to be a part of it. I do not want to be omitted from this kingdom that's on the horizon. We are returning to Israel. We are beginning to see hope in Zion. I posted on Facebook a quote from a song that I heard. The rudder of my soul is pointed to Mount Zion. I love that little quote taken from a song. The rudder of my soul is pointed to Mount Zion. And it is. Each of us, the rudder of our soul should be focused directly on Mount Zion. The hope that God will provide in Zion. A few weeks ago I spoke concerning the relevance of Mount Zion. What does it mean? 
It's symbolic, yes, it's metaphoric, yes, but it points to the hope that God is bringing. His kingdom to be established through His Son, the great and high priest. That's where our hope is. That's how we begin to return to Israel. In God's timeline, again, the basis from where all history is determined. All history is determined from that timeline that God has set in place. On that timeline, God has set a time to favor Zion. He refers to that time as a moed, like a festival, in other words. God has appointed an appointed time, a festival time, almost you can say, when he will begin to refavor Zion. And when he does, his servants will respond. Who would be his servants? Well, the church and Israel. We'll read this here in a moment in Psalm 102. God has set an appointed time to favor Zion. And when he does, his servants will bristle. His servants will come alive. In Psalm 102, let's read it. We've read this many times and I'm, I'm pretty sure we'll read it many more times. Psalm 102, I'll read 12 to 17. This is very, very essential for our, for our hope and our message concerning Zion. But you, O Lord, abide forever, and your name to all generations. You will arise and have compassion on Zion. For it is time to be gracious to her. The appointed time has come. Surely your servants find pleasure in her stones and feel pity for her dust. The time to favor Zion. When that time comes, his servants will have pity for her dust and have compassion for Zion. Let's read that 14 again. Surely your servants find pleasure in her stones and have pity for her dust. Many, many times I've taken groups to Kedumim and it's always, it's always wonderful to see how people react to putting their hands in the soil, to putting their hands in the dirt. Believers, not everyone, <laughs> Rejoices in moving stones and digging holes, uh, dragging wheelbarrows if we had them even. Not everyone rejoices in it as we go. Some people just say, this is too much work. But many of us, I find that most of us who are filled with the Spirit of God, it is a joyful thing. We have pity in her dust and we rejoice in the work that's at hand. Why is that? This is the fulfillment of what the psalmist said, what the psalmist wrote. That God has appointed a time to favor Zion. And when he does, his servants will bristle, will have pity, will, will, will fall in love with the very land itself. How many of you have gone to the land of Israel and have fallen in love with the land, the very terrain, the dirt, the stones? I've never loved stones in my life, but I love stones when I go to Israel. Yes. Yes. Verse 14 to 17. Surely your servants find pleasures in her stones and feel pity for her dust. So the nations will fear the name of the Lord and all the kings of the earth your glory. For the Lord has built up Zion. He has appeared in his glory. He has regarded the prayer of the destitute and has not despised their prayer. The Lord has appeared in Zion. It is happening. This is that set time, folks. We're no longer in an epoch of Christianity where we can ignore this. This is front and center. This is, this, is, this is perhaps the most driving aspect of modern Christianity today, but we're all focusing on everything else that does not count. I've got to tell you, I keep bringing this up because it's absolutely true. The most odious thing that I see in, in, that I see in the Christian landscape today is corporate Christianity. It is the most odious thing. How many of us have had experiences with corporate America? Is it a wonderful thing? How many of us, we now hold wonderful ex experiences from, from working in corporate America? No. How many of us are completely disoriented and disenfranchised with corporate America because we only came close to it? I am. Entirely. Corporate America has become corporate Christianity. I don't know if you know this. Christianity has embraced the corporate model 
which began with the military in the 1950s. After World War II, Eisenhower told us about the what? What did Eisenhower told, tell us about the military complex? Beware of the military industrial complex. Effectively, he was saying, there's something on the horizon that's going to bring about a synchronicity in the military that's going to be horrible. He was talking about a corporation, that the military would become corporate. That model has seeped into to global business. Now it's in Christianity. In other words, you have... Now, how many of you have been in the military? You know what that corporate model is like, right? SOPs and everything else. You know it. It's in the church. It does not belong in the church. I'm going to say this. I'll say it once. If you have a, if you have a question about it, come talk to me. The corporate model is of the devil. The corporate model is of the devil. It does nothing to elevate God and his kingdom. It does nothing to promote true unity among humans. It does everything to divide. It's a beast, right? It's self-sustaining. It is. It is literally a beast. Corporate global is the beast. And that's the final thing I'll say about that. The corporate entity of this world that encompasses business, medical, uh, yeah, religion now, the military, it's, there, it's all aspects of this beast that John saw in Revelation chapter 13, that Daniel saw in Revelation chapter 7. It is the beast. That's a whole different set of teachings. So, it's happening right before us. And yet, this is that set time. So I said to you just now that the devil is reactionary. He's reacting to what God is doing. And what we're seeing is the devil's, was, was Babel a corporate entity? When Nimrod set up Babel, wasn't that a corporate entity? Absolutely it was. It was nothing but demonic of the devil himself. It's no different today. Don't be teased by it. Don't be, don't be, don't be deceived by it. It's nothing but of the devil. Pastor Ken, many, many years ago, wrote a little book called uh, Redemption. Redemption, little booklet. In that book, Redemption, he talked about a polarization that will occur in the Christian world. And that this polarization would be distinct and vivid. And it would, it would, it would encompass all of Christianity. In other words, all of Christianity will be forced to make a decision on what pole they stand. We're coming to that place. We're not far off. When Pastor Ken Garrison wrote that book and, and gave that information in there, he was incredibly prophetic, pointing to this very time that we're living in right now. We may not be on that threshold, but we're approaching that threshold right now. It's right before us. That time when every Christian is going to have to make a decision. Do I pull to the left? My left. <clears throat> your right. Okay, we'll do your left. Do I pull to the left? <clears throat> do I become a part of that global corporate Christianity? Where it's like a cookie-cutting machine. Everyone believes the same thing. It's SOPs, standard belief systems. Do I pull to the left? That pull to the left is anti-Israel. We already know that it is. It is vehemently anti-Israel. It is anti-anointing. It is anti-Christ. Now, you might, you might say, well, he's gone too far with that statement. Search it out yourself. What's happening in modern corporate Christianity is not anointed by God, not even close. The messages are not anointed. The messages are not coming from the Holy Spirit. It's coming from a place of, 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 uh, of philosophy, Self-help teachings. How to make yourself a better human being. Seven steps. You get a lot of that in corporate Christianity, don't you? There are many people that are breaking away. Don't think that this is, you know, hopeless. There are many people, many churches that are breaking away from that corporate thing. That's the polarization process. But that pole to the left, it is the beast. It is the false prophet of Revelation chapter 13 on to chapter 20. Chapter 20 is when we see the end of it, don't we? Who knows what the end of the beast and the false prophet is that we find in Revelation chapter 20? 
Satan is thrown into the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet are also. Hallelujah. And that's the end of it. That's happening, folks. It's happening right before us. Don't gravitate to the left. Remain focused on what God is doing, which happens to be on the far right because there's a pole. That's the thing about polarization. Polarization, by implication, means that there's a separation occurring. Is there a point where one of those poles are going to stop? Perhaps. <laughs> the pole to the right will not stop until Zion is established. We on the right, who have chosen the word of God, chosen to be biblical, we will continue to poll until the day of Christ. We have to decide where we stand. Are we going to return to Israel? Are we going to be the ones that Micah saw? The, the rest of his brothers and sisters, the offspring that will return to Israel, are we going to be that people or are we going to allow the world, the poll to the left, to draw us in? You're going to see your family members drawn in. I'm going to tell you that right now. I have family members. You're going to see loved ones, friends, fellow, fellow congregants drawn in. What are you going to do? How are you going to respond? Are you prepared to respond? Do you have a, a plan for when your own family says, you know what, you're crazy. You keep pulling to the right. I'm going to the left. Do you have a response plan? Or are you just going to feel sorry and go along with them? Many of you will. You'll go along to get along. And you're already doing it. No. Not so with me. Not so for those who are the brothers and sisters of Messiah. Not so with the remnant church who will pull to the right. That polling process is important, folks. The thing that will keep us pulling to the right, the thing that will keep us in standing with God, right standing with God, is His Word. Amen. His Word. His Word is the only thing that will keep us away from that church to the left. And that's why you go to those churches on the left and you don't hear the Bible much. They elude to it. They paraphrase it out of context in many cases. They don't give you line by line, verse by verse, cross-referencing to, ver cross to verify like I do and many others do. They don't do that. They just elude to a, a passage and take it out of context to validate their position, their ideology. That's not Christianity. That's not being a brother or a sister of Jesus. That's not being part of the child that Micah saw. No. That's being drawn into Babel. Because Babel is real, folks. It's right here. It's right before us. When Jesus comes, I love that statement, when Jesus comes. There's a song like that. When Jesus comes. You know it? We can sing it. When Jesus comes, what is he going to do? We know it, right? He's going to set up a kingdom. It's going to be, it's going to be a millennial kingdom. It's going to be a wonderful kingdom. Let's read. Let's read in Micah. Let's read what, about what will happen when Jesus comes. When Jesus comes. What's that song anyway? Oh, oh sunny day? Oh, sunny day? Is that what it is? Oh, happy days. Right. Oh, happy days. Right, right. I'm not going to sing it. I don't know the song well enough to even try. Oh, happy days when Jesus comes. Right? That's how it goes. It's a true song. It will be a happy day when Jesus comes. Not for that church on the left. That will not be a happy day, folks. It'll be a happy day for us. It'll be a happy day for, it'll be a happy day for creation. What did Paul say about the time when the sons of God comes? What did Paul say in Romans chapter 8? It will be a happy day for the whales. It'll be a happy day for the owls. And the creatures, the mountains, the streams, the valleys, it will be a happy day for God's creation. It'll be a happy day for us. Because we would be the ones bringing redemption. That's a happy day. So let's read here in Isaiah, in uh, Micah, same passage from Micah chapter 5. We're going to read verse 4 and 5. Now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, before I do that, I'll read verse 3 again. Therefore he will give up 
he will give them up, excuse me, until the time when she who is in labor has born a child. You're that child. In Christ you are. Then the remainder, the remnant of his brethren, will return to the sons of Israel. That's what we're doing right now. And he will arise and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord and the majesty of his name, of the name of the Lord, his God. And they will remain, referring to Israel, and they will remain because at that time he will be great to the ends of the earth. This one will be our peace. That happens when Jesus comes. That's a happy day. Oh, happy day for sure when Jesus comes. But before that comes a great conflict. Is that true? This is a happy day. This happy day is before us. It's inevitable. It's coming. But before that, what happens? There's a great conflict. That great conflict is what some of us are feeling right now. How do we deal with that polarization? I'm seeing friends. I'm seeing family. I'm seeing people that I care for gravitate into the left. Some are falling headlong into it. This is that conflict that will come before this great and happy day when Jesus comes. The conflict is on. Some of us, again, we're actually feeling it. We're seeing it. I hate what I see. For my loved ones, for my family, for my brothers and sisters, I hate what I see. Am I going to gravitate to the left because I hate what I see? Am I going to allow myself to be pulled because family members, loved ones, and people I love here, even from the church, are going to the left? No, I'm not. I'm going to keep focused on what God is doing and where He is taking us. Because this brings salvation. This is where salvation comes from. Remember, in Christ, you are that child. Am I stretching this too far? No, I'm absolutely not. In Messiah, you are that child. You will bring redemption. And so, therefore, it's important for you not to gravitate to the left. If you care about redemption, and I know you do. Yes, there's coming a great conflict. It's already before us. How is it? How is it that President Biden is almost neck to neck with Trump? How is it? How is that even possible? When the entire Republican Party is 100% almost behind Trump. Listen, I'm, I'm, I'm apolitical. I'm not political. I may or may not vote in the next elections. But the deception, the, the decline, the degradation is on. It's happening. There is deception occurring on a level that has never been possible. You think Goebbels was, was good? You think Hitler's Goebbel, chief of propaganda, was good? He was good. Not like what we're seeing today. What we're seeing today is a whole next level good. Oh, they're capable. Because they're doing it to the entire world. And they are a global corporation. And they're succeeding. So don't, don't sit back and say, oh, that's just conspiracy talk. He's always been a conspiracy-minded person. Yes, because conspiracies are real. The Bible tells us in Psalm 83 and Psalm 2 that the nations are conspiring. Yes, the conspiracy is real. Don't get caught blinded. Don't be, don't be, don't be lulled into that second place, that secondary place. That secondary place is the lake of fire. So for us, we have to check ourselves. We have to give ourselves a gut check. See where we are. Am I where I'm supposed to be? Yeah, that preacher keeps annoyingly talk, talk about things that are challenging to me, and maybe that's what he's supposed to do. Maybe that's what he gets paid to do. So I'll just sit there and go through the motions and just go about my business. Some of us are exactly in that place. And you're unwilling to recognize the reality of what's actually before us. I'm not here because I'm being paid. You pay me and that's besides the point. I'm here to do what I'm anointed to do, what I'm called by God to do, 
to point to the reality of what's before us, to say to you, he's coming, straighten up. Your redemption is nigh. But before it comes, be prepared for what must come. This tribulation. You're not going to be raptured out of this, folks. No. The rapture comes when Jesus comes. Not when you want it to happen. We all want it to happen when things get tough, don't we? That's when we want to be raptured out. It's not going to work that way. We can't manipulate God into taking us when we want to go. No matter who believes it, no matter who came up with the crazy idea to begin with. No, we stay with the Bible. Jesus comes, then he assembles the church. Until then, we have to endure, we have to overcome. Didn't he say that? Rapture, being raptured out of here, there's no need for endurance, there's no need for overcoming, is there? Because you just relax, get some more credit cards, I think I'll buy a boat, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll mortgage a house and buy stuff because I'm being raptured. What am I to worry about anyway? I can live anyway because it's all going to come to an end when he comes. Look, he's coming. He's, he's, he's right around the corner. I think I'll go get a loan. Or I'll buy a house on the beach because I'm going to be raptured out of here anyway. No, we have to be prepared because, according to the Bible, there's no chance of you being raptured out before the tribulation come. Jesus said concerning overcoming, those of you that overcome, just as I have overcome and sit at my Father's right hand, you who have overcome will sit with me at my right hand as well. You must overcome. You must face the reality of what's coming, folks. It's coming The end of it is beautiful. What a happy day when Jesus comes, when Jesus arrives, brings redemption. Those of us here that are struggling with the period of waiting, that you've waited all these years, and, uh, you know, I'm just going through this. This is is meaningless to me anymore. I, I don't have the passion that I used to have. You need to find that passion. You need to come back to that place where this is real, meaningful, and deep, profound to you. Don't become lukewarm when things are now beginning to warm up, to get hot. Don't become lukewarm. Get hot. Heat up. Become the people that you're supposed to be. One of the things that I'm excited about is we have some young people in the congregation, some younger families that are, that are beginning to, 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 be, to, be, to be drawn into the ministry. That's exciting. Amen. That's exciting. Because one of the tendencies we have that sometimes is almost impossible to overcome is as we get older, we get colder. That's a difficult thing that we have to struggle with. It doesn't have to be that way. It's a tendency. We have to overcome that. But many of us have become cold. Don't have that heat, that fire, that passion anymore. You can have it. It's there for you. You just have to find the find the the kindling for it. You have to find the wood to keep that, that, that flame going. You have to find the flame. And that's only in God's word. Folks, you ought to be on your faces. Seeking God's face, pressing into him. If you don't have this type of vital relationship with God, it's time to cry out for it. It's time to to beseech God. You know what the spirit of supplication is? It's mentioned in the Bible, but do you know what the spirit of supplication is? No? We should. It's mentioned clearly, a spirit of supplication it's very real. What is the spirit of supplication, folks? Someone tell me. This being on your face, that spirit, that broken and contrite spirit that cries out to God, that petitions God, a spirit of supplication, we need it. We need that. You might think everything's fine, everything's aligned pretty nicely, <laughs> you know, financially, family, vehicles are all working fine, everything's in order, but you are miserable and desperate and you need to, uh, to, uh, to apply that spirit of supplication because there's something powerful that's vying for you, very powerful. 
very deceptive, very controlling, very manipulative, filled with nuances that will easily get you to agree with them. That is deadly. That drags people into the lake of fire. Stay with his word. Stay broken and humble before him. Cry out to him as much as you can because we live in a very difficult time and you have to endure, you have to overcome, you have to persevere. And the only way you're going to do that is if you stay on your face with the Bible before you. You stay in his word on your face. It's the only way you're going to do it. You're not going to find another way to do it, folks. Amen. Now, you guys, you guys might be quite fortunate because the food next door might be ready, but then again, you might not be. Uh, Willie is quick to put up his hand. No, I'll give it five more minutes. Because I think you need to just settle in and take seriously what's being said. Not only by me. You heard, you heard what this, this young man said. He spoke about how Christians, we should be ashamed. Yeah. And we should be. Now, he spoke on a very broad level concerning Israel, our commitment to Israel. I'm speaking to you in regards to your commitment to Jesus, your commitment to the kingdom of God, your commitment to serving him in that place that he has allotted for you. How hot is your flame? Is your flame dwindling? Are you now in the category of being lukewarm? Are you slated for being cold? It doesn't have to be that way. The fight for us as we grow older is to keep that heat going. Don't get old and cold. Keep your flame alive. Keep that flame stoked. Stoke it with the word of God. Stoke it with prayer. Stoke it with love. Stoke it with forgiveness. Stoke it with commitment for God. And your flame will burn hot. You will not be lukewarm. And that's where we are. Pray for the young people in the congregation. No doubt they will, they will be faced with challenges. Pray for the young families. No doubt they will be faced with challenges. We that are older, that are well established in the congregation, we ought to be an example to the younger families. That's, that's our mission at this point. To point the way for them. To be an example, to be an encouragement too. To be someone that they can come to and say, I'm struggling with my homeschooling or I'm struggling with my teenagers. Can you help us? Tell me, what did you do? How did you overcome? That's our position, those of us that are older. We're not to dwindle off into never, never land. One of the things that, that, that I always take note of is that we have, we have at least a 20% drop in, in seat occupancy once the message begins. People take off. Find some reason to be next door. Oh, I have to be over there. I can't be here. I've got to go somewhere. I know that I am not the most entertaining preacher there is. Yes. <laughs> and that's good. Because I'm not here to entertain you. I know that I don't make you feel warm and fuzzy and give you nice feelings. I understand that. I can do that stuff if I wanted to. But I will not be true to his word. And I will not be fair to you if I were to do that. So my mission is to present whatever the Holy Spirit gives me and to present it as raw and direct as I possibly can. No euphemisms. euphemisms. No, no, no flowery word, no treating, no treatments to make this word more palatable to you. That's not what I'm here to do, and that's not what I'm going to do. I'm going to present it as straightforwardly as I can. I'm not going to use psychology. I'm not going to use nuances. I'm going to tell you point blank, based on the word of God. Now, if I'm off, if, if, if my treatment of the word of God is off, please come and tell me. People have done that before. They're no longer alive. No. <laughs> People have done that before. And I sit with them. I say, okay, tell me what you see in here. And I say, oh, okay, yeah, all right. So my consideration was off. I was wrong. 
But I'm only going to give you the Word of God. I'm not going to give you anything else. I'm not going to feed you with things that makes you feel good. You say, but you have to edify me. I'm going to edify you with the Word. It's the only thing that can truly edify you. Now, if you were of this world, if you were not someone who, were, who was born again and filled with the Holy Spirit, you would need something more than me to edify you. I can only go so far with that. But you are born again filled with the Holy Spirit of God. All that can edify you is the Word of God. And all I can do is present it to you. Here's what God said. Okay? So I am personally, I consider myself blessed to be able to get up on a, on a, on a Sunday morning and prepare for a week of serving God. Believing that I'm going to teach Zemach, I'm going to do all these things that I'm supposed to do, but I don't have a clue what I'm going to do. I just know that God's going to anoint me. So I'm incredibly blessed to be able to stand here and believe that God's word is what I'm presenting to you through his anointing. You have to decide if you want to receive it or if you want to walk about outside or, or go next door and, and, and not even consider what, what the Holy Spirit is saying. You might say, well, it's redundant. I've heard it before. Well, maybe you haven't taken it in. That's why it has become redundant to you. I remember sitting under Ken Garrison for many years on this teaching and preaching, and they were basically the same thing over and over, more or less, presented with different applications and, and different points and so on, but it was the same message. It was one message. Pastor Ken himself used to say there's only, every preacher has one message only, and it's true. I have one message. I try to color it different or present it from a different angle from time to time, but I have one message. But I remember many, many times I would come in, I would sit, I wouldn't miss a message for nothing. Because I always believed that even though I've heard it before, something new will come forth. And if it's not for me, it's for someone else. And I'm going to sit here and witness that occurrence. I'm going to sit here and witness the Holy Spirit move through that preacher to speak to someone. If not me, someone else. And I'll rejoice in it. Because God is speaking. It's not something you walk away from. It's not something you turn your back from. You may not like me. You may not like my style. I might be abrasive to you. But, but do you love God? Do you love his word? I happen to be the guy that's appointed to give the word. Don't look at me. If you look at me, you're going to have problems. Listen to what God is saying. Look to God. He will sustain you. This is too critical a time that we're in right now to not be serious at this point. That entity to the left, it's becoming stronger, folks. I hate to tell you. It's becoming rapidly stronger. Is there anyone here this morning that does not believe that that corporate church thing, global beast, is becoming stronger? <clears throat> is there anyone that does not believe it? No, it is rapidly becoming stronger. It's going to become much more strong before its end comes. But its end is coming. Jesus brings the end to it. And my prayer is that each of us will be with him as he comes. Young people, don't let this message give you a sense of dismalness. Is that a word? Yeah. Don't be, don't be discouraged by this word. It's dismal. No, it's not dismal. It's hope. If you have hope in this, you have hope that 99.99% of your peers do not have. If you have hope in his kingdom. Amen. And stay with it. Don't be discouraged. Don't let that subtle dragon draw you in. He is subtle. But he's a, he's a dragon and he will bring destruction. So, pray for the youth in this congregation, please do. Pray that God will in fact... Continue to uphold them and provide for them every impetus to serve him and serve him well. Everything that they need is set before them. We just have to bathe them with prayer. You've heard that term before? We have to bathe them with prayer. And God is faithful. Those of us that have adult children that are not exactly walking in the way that they should. Some of us, we have adult children and they're very successful in many ways but they're not where they should be. 
in terms of walking with God. Don't give up. Don't be discouraged. Continue to intercede for your adult children. God is faithful. I was on my face this morning at about 4 o'clock, praying and interceding. And for years, I've been waiting on that unction. Who knows what an unction is? All right. You know, an unction leads to faith, right? Is that true? An unction leads to faith. Now, those of you that know what an unction is. How many of us does not know what an unction is? All right, a couple of you. All right. An unction is sort of a... Who wants to give a definition of the word unction? I can give one. Who wants to give a definition of the word unction? A sense that the Holy Spirit is upon you. Yeah. Right. It can... A prompting... That's, that's more, a little more than an unction. Yes, but you're right. So that's an unction. Basically, that's an unction. When you have this incredible spiritual experience, the Holy Spirit prompts you, touches you. And it doesn't have to be the Holy Spirit. It can be God himself. Or Yeshua himself speaks to you in your heart, and it becomes real, and you have a quickening experience. That's an unction. So for years, I've been praying for an unction for my children, that I would have faith for their lives. Because I know that I can pray, I can desire my best intentions, but without the unction, without faith, I'm not, I'm not getting there. Or, oh, nothing's going to happen without that unction and that faith. So I've been praying, I've been actually praying for God to give me the unction for years. You know, so I'm on my knees about 4.20 this morning, and I went down to pray, got the unction. Really, for the first time concerning the things I've been praying about. So now I have the faith and the conviction that the things that I pray about concerning my family, the unction has been given. Amen. It's on its way. Stay on your face before God. He will give you the things you pray about. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you your heart's desire. What the psalm does not say is that delighting yourself in the Lord takes work. It takes getting up early. It takes getting on your knees. It takes going before him. And he will give you your heart's desire. It's as if he wants you to prove that you want these things. He can give you it as soon as you ask. God, help this person. This person is desperately in need of prayer. Thank you, Lord. It doesn't work like that. He wants you to keep coming back. He wants you to keep on your knees, keep on your face, and prove that it is a part of your given priesthood to intercede for that person, and you're prepared to do it. And when he sees the time, when he determines that the time is right, he'll answer. That's the way God works. We can't claim uh, some sort of a, 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 a you know, a, 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 he, he has to answer our prayer. You know, we, we, have, we have a special dispensation almost. And so if you pray for something, you're going to get it. It doesn't work like that. Okay? If you have a matter that's really important in your life, children, family, fathers, whatever it is, and you pray and you say, okay, now I've prayed God, now I'm entitled to an answer. I'm going to go about my business. Because I've already prayed, I'm entitled. What do you think? Is God committed to your prayer? Sense of entitlement? No. He wants you to be on your knees. He wants to see those scars on your elbows. He wants you on the ground with your nose to the floor. And you will prove your want. You will prove your priesthood. So that's where we are, folks. Happy days. Oh, happy days when Jesus comes. He'll put an end to all of the strife, all of the wickedness. Can't wait, actually. I cannot wait. Got excited when Trump got elected in 2018. Well, maybe a change will come. That excitement is going to multiply on order of magnitude when Jesus comes. Because I know that he will not sell out the land. I know he will not, he will not talk himself into stupidity like Trump did. I know he'll be a righteous king and rule for all eternity. God, we ask for your strength. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would 
Give us everything we need, Lord, to honor you, serve you, and to walk before you in a way to glorify you. This is our heart's desire, Lord, that we will glorify you and honor you. So, Lord, teach us. Give us hope in your Son and Him only, Lord. Help us, steer us away from having hope in anything else. This world system, Lord, we know is dying, coming to an end. But your kingdom is on the horizon. And we thank you, Lord, for this. You've given us eyes to see, and we declare our, our praises to you. We thank you, Lord. Amen.